Uh, welcome, Stephen, and thank, thank you, you very much you, for being yeah. with us. And okay. bienvenido, Luis. Welcome. Eh, la verdad es que es un lujo teneros aquí a ambos para, para cerrar el, el, el congreso. Eh, uh, you are really generous, uh, Stephen, because we know that uh, you are now uh, in the United States, so the difference in time is, is, very, is very important, and we are very happy uh, to, to count on you for this conference. Uh, I would like to make maybe a, a little formal presentation, and after that, uh, we, can, we can start. Si, si estás de acuerdo, Luis, como conductor de la... Sí, sí, perfecto. Uh, uh, I will... I will introduce you in, in Spanish for a moment, and then uh, the floor will be, will be yours, of course. Uh, Stephen Eisenman, uh, bueno, yo creo que es un, estamos ante un académico uh, extraordinario en muchos sentidos por su doble faceta de académico, de activista, por cómo uh, le concierne muy en particular la cuestión de la violencia política, que para, para nuestra investigación ha sido absolutamente caudal, al mismo tiempo que otras cuestiones que han ido apareciendo, que han ido desfilando por, nuestras, por, por, por nuestras, uh, nuestros intereses en la representación de la esfera pública, como son el, los derechos humanos, obviamente, el animalismo y toda una serie de preocupaciones también por lo que podríamos llamar el planetary well-being. Hay un libro central, uh, creo yo, que afortunadamente lo tenemos, lo tenemos publicado en, en castellano, que es este, el efecto Abu Ghraib, que eh, para nosotros fue eh, realmente capital eh, ya desde el origen, desde el principio de, de la investigación. Es un libro además que en la versión española de San Soleil fue actualizado con toda una serie de materiales y que en el décimo aniversario de su publicación original en inglés, pues uh, Stephen Eisenman diría que ha glosado o expand ha expandido con un texto absolutamente extraordinario que se llama Black Ops in Art and History, eh, a mí me parece uno de los textos más uh, insólitos sobre, eh, acaba de aparecer sobre violencia política, sobre las operaciones encubiertas o black ops de, de, de diferentes gobiernos, ¿no? donde realmente, mm, más allá de lo estrictamente iconográfico, diría que el trabajo de Stephen Eisenman eh, supone un compromiso total antropológico con, con, con el ser humano, con los derechos humanos en general, al mismo tiempo que... Eh, en su, en su labor, digamos, como historiador del arte en la Northwestern University, eh, en, en, la, en la University of Florida um, y, y en los diferentes libros que ha, que ha publicado, además del efecto Abu Ghraib, quiero destacar sobre todo The Cry of Nature, Arts and the Making of Animal Rights o Gauguin Skirt, o incluso un, un libro que está editado aquí también por Akal, que es una especie de de gran manual histórico uh, que se llama 19th Century Art, a Critical History, eh, y en su, mm, creo yo, brillante ap aproximación a William Blake, William Blake in the Age of Aquarius, Northwestern uh, Block Museum, que fue premiado además uh, por el New York Times como el mejor libro de arte de 2017, en todas esas aproximaciones destila sobre todo ese, ese, ese compromiso que ha llevado a, a término social además, eh, en una organización eh, que se llama Times Year 10 de reforma de las prisiones en, en Estados Unidos, al mismo tiempo que en, una, en otra ONG que fundó en 2017 que se llama Anthropocene Alliance. ¿no? A mí me parece que encontrar un académico que tenga este uh, compromiso tan extremo con, con, con la realidad es algo muy, muy inusual y realmente muy, muy valioso, incluso... Quisiera, para quien no haya tenido ocasión o no, no conozca sus columnas en la revista Counterpunch, eh, animaros a, a, a que las leáis, son, escribe con gran frecuencia en Counterpunch. A mí me parece, por ejemplo, que entre sus últimos artículos, Kabul on my mind es una reflexión sobre Afganistán que prolonga tanto el, el, el texto de, de Abu Ghraib Effect como Black Ops in Art and History. Y... Eh, From this moment on, I, I really want to thank you again, uh, Stephen, uh, for, for being with us. And uh, me gustaría también presentar, aunque fuese muy brevemente, a Luis Vives uh, Ferrandiz, porque eh, para empezar es la persona que me dio a conocer este libro, eh, algo que le agradeceré hasta el fin de mis días. 
Eh, Luis Vives Fernández es doctor en Historia del Arte por la Universidad de Valencia, que es donde imparte clases. Ha estado haciendo estancias de investigación en centros muy diversos, entre los cuales el Marburg Institute, eh, becado además por eh, instituciones muy diversas, el Museo de la Ciudad de Valencia, el Museo Valenciano de la Ilustración y la Modernidad, y eh, sus publicaciones que pueden encontrarse en, en, en numerosas uh, revistas como Ars Longa, como Goya, como Caracteres. A mí me parece que ha ido fraguando todo un dispositivo iconográfico que en los últimos años, diría sobre todo en los últimos tiempos, se ha desplazado, ha desplazado su interés hacia esa relación entre tradición e imagen 2.0, por así decirlo, es decir, imagen eh, digital. ¿no? Eh, dirige la colección Pigmalión de, de esta misma editorial que ha publicado el efecto Aburay, que es eh, San Soleil, y eh, incluso me atrevería, si me permites, Luis, a um, recomendar no solo, por ejemplo, la introducción de ese libro fundamental de David Friedberg, que es Las máscaras de Abby Barburg, sino uh, o ese, ese gran libro que, que, que has editado, que es El legado visual de Erwin Panofsky, Síntomas culturales, sino un libro que pasó quizá un poco inadvertido en su momento, pero a mí me parece de una vigencia extraordinaria y de una penetración tremenda en las imágenes de la esfera pública y del poder, que es cuando despertó el elefante todavía estaba ahí, un libro colectivo sobre la imagen de, del rey, del rey emérito en la cultura visual española, que me parece un, un libro bueno, más que pertinente en este contexto. Quiero agradeceros a los dos vuestra, vuestra presencia. And uh, the floor is yours, Luis, Stephen, uh, thank you again for being with us. Um, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ivan. Uh, well, first, I would like to, to thank Ivan for not also for not only for the presentation, but for inviting me to this conversation and also for the conference in general. I mean, I was following some of the discussions and they have been uh, amazing. I have learned a lot and they have been very inspirational. And I have a lot of ideas to work with in the future, you know, especially this idea of the algorithm and the artificial, in the, uh, artificial, artificial intelligence. And I would like also to apologize for my English because it's not as good as I would like to talk in this context on this conference, but I do my best to, 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 to talk with, uh, with Stephen. Maybe my, my English is not the best. Now I am realizing that I have the sun entering in my window and the, my image, I think, is not also the best one. But okay, it's, uh, it's this uh, timetable that it's uh, just the sun you look, entering you in my look, window. You all look lovely. Okay. All look lovely. <laughs> and, well, in my opinion, I would like to introduce a little bit about uh, Stephen Eisenman. That is one of the most original voices in the art history, in the present art history, a scenario, not only for his research topics that Ivan has quoted very well, torture, animal rights, or ecology, but for me, for his methodological uh, approach, because the first time that I read the Abu Ghraib effect, you know, the book that Ivan showed uh, before, I was uh, astonished or open mouth because uh, I found a, a very original and innovative perspective. Uh, the combination of past and present images, how contemporary images of uh, torture, a dialogue with images from the past, with works of art from the past. And this book made me think a lot about my, my own research. And it was very inspirational and a kind of wake up call for me because since I read this book, I can say that I, that I decided to uh, to think in what is, what is going to be my approach to art history. So um, I decided to use my art history knowledge to understand the world I live in. And so in that sense, I, Stephen, uh, we have here students, researchers, colleagues. What can you tell us about your art history methodology or how can you work to, to write a book like, like this? Um, well, first of all, it's delightful to see you all. And um, Luis, your English is quite good. And I recognize that there may be people here whose English isn't so good. I'll try to speak slowly and clearly. And if there's a place where I speak in such a way as to confuse you, please signal or put up the little hands and I'll try to repeat it to make it more clear. Um, Luis, you were asking about method and approach 
and about the expansiveness with which I uh, practice art history. That is that I try to bring images from the past into dialogue with images and experiences in the present. That's certainly something that I try to do. Um, I suppose uh, my methodology, uh, broadly speaking, is lies within the Marxist tradition, that's clear. Um, it also means that it lies, since the way that Marx, is, Marx does, in the Hegelian tradition, in the sense that I take as a byword the phrase, the truth is the whole, that is the study of totality. Um, it's very difficult to distinguish uh, causes from effects at times, uh, to distinguish one lineage, one tradition from another. One has to step back and try to look at the whole. So that's the kind of work that I've been trying to do as the kind of teaching that I've always done, that is to try to synthesize and to uh, understand uh, our totality. Um, that usually means in a study of works of art to understand them within their social and political uh, dynamic. Uh, it means seeing a work of art as a nexus, a location in history where different ideological forces come to contact and where different works of art are responding to those ideologies in salient or powerful ways or in ways which indicate that they are um, accepting of the given uh, dominant ideological paradigm. So yes, I want to look at uh, works of art within their history uh, within the totality of that history, it means a social history. I, under, I heard Yvonne, I think, speaking about the word anthropological. Uh, the anthropological is certainly uh, an approach that I take uh, insofar as I want to look at different um, social uh, levels within society to see how different groups produce images and how those images work to produce a single uh, total manifestation at a particular moment in time. Um, just a little bit about um, the Abu Ghraib effect in that regard, and also some of my other recent work. Um, uh, it's always interested me that works of art uh, always have a tradition. They always exist within the lineage. Images always work within a lineage. Um, every work that we produce, every image that we see is made by a person who sees uh, works of art lined up. I mean, marks in the uh, 1844 manuscripts thinks about the making of a work of art as the practice and the achievement of an entire history leading up to the present moment. There is no single creator of a work of art. There is a long tradition of creators of works of art that ultimately leads to a single moment. So I take that that seriously. And when it came to the Abu Ghraib effect, um, I remember the generation of that book. Um, it was when I was trying to think about that terrible image of the hooded figure standing on the crate. And it reminded me of images by Goya. And I immediately said to myself, well, that can't be right. Goya was condemning torture and uh, oppression uh, and uh, celebrating instead forces of liberation and freedom. How could Goya's images have anything to do with that horrible image that I saw? And then I began to think about uh, a lineage of those images. Uh, the, the line that's, that links uh, Goya and the present. And then I began to wonder whether Goya may have been familiar with the practices described at Abu Ghraib prison. He might have been using some of the things that he read about and knew about or had even seen and trying to invert them. The people at Abu Ghraib prison, the American uh, military figures and the ones who took those photo photographs were not using those that image as a kind of inversion or critique, but rather constructing the very scenarios of violence and torture that Goya was himself condemning. So in some ways, Goya existed within that tradition, even if he was promoting the opposite set of uh, political values. And that led me to think, well, uh, where did these uh, contemporary soldiers get their images from? They couldn't have been looking at Goya. Uh, the idea that uh, Sergeant Grainer this, uh, or Lindsay, um, I forgot, I forgot the last time, the, the two of the key figures who took the photographs at Abu Ghraib prison and who were represented in those photographs, the idea that they could have seen Goya was uh, more or less unimaginable. But they had seen other images of torture and destruction. So what were those? And then I started to think about filmic images. 
and uh, press photography and snapshots and pornography, all the world of images that we now know are so easily available and so ubiquitous. So how did those contemporary torturers assimilate that tradition? How did that tradition itself, where was, what was its history? And again, following the trace, the lineage, uh, back further and further until it constituted in a Warburgian sense, a certain kind of pathos formula, pathos formula. Um, and that became the, the basis of the book. But, but it really was generated by an insight, a quick insight. And that insight, and this is something I would say to those of you who are graduate students, how many of you are, are graduate students uh, or undergraduate students? Can you like raise your hand or make a little thing? in your computer by that few of you, okay, more of you. Um, this is where graduate school training of a traditional kind, I hate to say that, um, really pays off because uh, one of the things that uh, I gained in my education as an art historian was a tremendous corpus of images. Just simply seeing a lot of stuff, seeing hundreds, uh, thousands of images. When I was first began training as an art historian at uh, Williams College for a master's and then Princeton for the PhD, um, the major part of art history was looking at the tradition. Where did this image come from? Or a manuscript work is called recensions, following an image all the way back to its point of origin. Um, and building up that corpus of images allows you when you see a contemporary image to begin to place it in a lineage. And once you've done that, you begin to have some clues that you can develop much further. So I, in that sense, while I work within a, a radical or Marxist historiographic tradition, which is considered uh, relatively new for art history, not so new, it goes back to the 1930s at least, um, I'm still very traditional in many of the ways that I work because I, I so much depend upon knowledge of a broad corpus uh, of, of images. And I think that this methodology uh, entails a different conception of time. You have talked about past, present, and this combination of different times, uh, I think it's fundamental for, uh, for, for this kind of, of, of research. And I think that time is perceived in a different way uh, when reading uh, the Abu Ghraib uh, effect, you know, this dialogue between Goya and the soldiers, William Blake and the photographs. And uh, it uh, reminds me uh, the time, the, con the, time the, the concept of time from Abi Barbu, this idea of pathos formal, but even the concept of uh, montage from the Atlas de Mocine. Mm -hmm. no, no, I was thinking in, in this idea that uh, me, sorry, uh, meaning is not in the, in the image, no? inside the object, no? inside the image we are studying, but meaning is in the relationships that we can make between images, no, between objects. No, the important is the bridge that we can build between yes. images, not what the image exactly wants to say or the artist wants uh, to say. So, or how we can, or, or the shift from a, a history of the artist, what the artist wanted to say, but a, a shift, a shift from a history of the spectators. What we do with those images. I, I agree with that completely. Um, uh, another part of my my training, and this is, um, you know, I'm you all are, are are lovely and young, and you have um, long careers ahead of you, I'm sure, and great successes. And I'm um, really after retired, just about retired, from Northwestern University. Um, although I'm not so old, I'm 65. Um, I went to university in the 19. 70s and into the 80s. Um, and during those years, the theoretical paradigms that I confronted were, first of all, uh, structuralism and um, Frankfurt School work and uh, post-structuralism. Uh, but the structural, structuralist insights really came at a fundamental moment for me in the middle 70s when I was completing my undergraduate and beginning to do work in at a, at a, for a master's degree. And that is the idea that um, meaning is derived by virtue of relationship of difference. Um, that the, there is no inherent meaning in the sign, but only by virtue of its 
location within a string of signs. Um, uh, so what you say about montage is part of that lineage. Of course, the history of montage in a photographic and filmic sense dates to the same moments as the origins of structuralist thought. One thinks about Roman Jakobson um, and various other Russian structuralists at the time when uh, Eisenstein and Budovskin and others were inventing um, cinematic montage and writing about it, theorizing about it. Um, and that idea, that insight is an essential Marxist vision as well. Um, uh, it uh, uh, accepts levels of meaning. It's also a, a insight that arrives from the Freudian tradition because it sees images as part of a geography. Uh, just as the mind is a geography, so images do. They, they bump up against one another, they collide with one another. Uh, out of that collision uh, are generated as Benjamin wrote, uh, sparks and, and energy and insights. So I think you're right, uh, Luis, I agree with you completely the, about the importance of that montage element in any uh, critical art historical perspective. Um, it's, you think about it as well in um, satire, which is so essential today in, in doing political work of one kind or another, um, looking at an image and trying to invert it. What are the implications of the image? How can we challenge that image with another image? Uh, we live in so image saturated a world, it's a cliche, but it's true, that in order to communicate and express ourselves, we must use images in order to challenge and combat other images. Yeah, yeah, completely, completely agree. Uh, well, this conversation is in a, in a conference, uh, which topic is uh, visual motives of power in the public sphere, no? and I think that well, the, the book of Abu Ghraib and your research and your papers, your books, uh, fits very well in this in this concept of uh, visual mo visual motives in the public sphere. But right. uh, your analysis of black ops and torture uh, aims to make visible to the public sphere some activities that are secret and invisible. No, there is a dialectic between the invisibility of torture and this idea of make visibility, uh, make visible uh, uh, torture. No, I've seen that uh, torture is a sacred practice, must be hidden, or governments try to make them hidden. But well, this pair of concepts of visibility and invisibility, uh, and invisibility, sorry, uh, I would like to introduce another pair of concepts: uh, image and power or visuality and power that I think is the, uh, the, the hallmark of the visual studies school, the American visual studies school, no? the, the understanding of the relationship between image and, and power. And I was thinking in a, in a book that probably you know, know by William Tom Mitchell, Cloning Terror, The War on Images from 9-11 to the present in which, yes. I mean, I think this, this, uh, this relationships between image and power in contemporary world and and in contemporary world is uh, fundamental to to be uh, uh, to be deciphered by by art historians no we, we we live in a world of images and we know what images mean and what happens with power i mean there are some ideas i don't know if i have, if i have explained them very well but how do you see this relationship between visuality and visibility and invisibility in torture and this relationship between need some power in the visual studies school. Right. Um, nice to see Tom Mitchell's book raised. He's a very close friend. And uh, in fact, I was just talking to him last week because he's going to be uh, participating in a conference in Malaga about Guernica. Yeah. Yeah, yes. And um, I, I had actually, it was funny because I had proposed a paper about Guernica and about black and white and images of power. And um, he had been asked to speak about Guernica. My paper was rejected by the organizers uh, in Malaga. Um, uh, and so Tom uh, called me up and said, um, Stephen, I'm, I'm going to deliver this keynote in Malaga um, about the Guernica. He says, he says, I don't know anything about Guernica. I haven't looked at Guernica in 40 years. What can you tell me? So, so he had, but of course, he's a, he says what he's been asked to do is to trace uh, a history of the uses of Guernica in popular mass culture, which is something that he frequently does and he's very good at. 
And I have no doubt that however long or short the period of time of preparation, uh, the town will do a terrific job. Um, but uh, it made me think about Guernica again and about um, images of power um, and how they operate. Um, so it, it, it's possible we could say a little bit about, about that picture since it's something that you all uh, presumably have seen frequently and, and know a lot about. I don't know how many of you will be attending that conference. Is that something that you all are aware of that, that, uh, that conference? I think it's at the end of, I think it's at the it's end of the month. It's uh, in it? November. Uh, oh, no, I, I think it's 18, yeah. 19 November. It's funny because yeah. I also was rejected. I also presented a, a paper to this conference and I also was be, rejected. Uh, a conference of the Repuse. We could have yeah, a, yes. we could have our own conference of all the refuse of, papers. Maybe some others of, of you have been And we could all have our own conference. At the same time, we could have a dueling conference. Uh, TJ Clark would have to join us because he's written about the Salon de Refuse. Hmm. But Manet, he'd have to come over and join us pretty soon. Yes. And, and then Tom would join us. We'd all have an exodus. Um, uh, in any case, um, uh, I'm a little bit avoiding your question about images of power. Uh, it's so broad and essential a question and one that we see all the time. And I think about how in the 1980s and 90s, um, Fred Jameson, uh, writing about postmodernism was addressing this in a new kind of way. Um, and I remember there was a photograph that he used, which was a Ronald Reagan. Uh, and then behind Ronald Reagan, you saw a gigantic photograph of Ronald Reagan or a projection of Ronald Reagan, you know, a huge thing. Um, in order to, to indicate, in some ways it was a new thing because of the uh, mass media and television and the broadcast 24 seven broadcast medium. But in another way, it was a throwback to the fascist era when discoveries were really made about the, the Fuhrer principle, the Fuhrer principle, the idea of the cult of the leader and recognition that the new mass media, newspapers, movies could be used to enhance, glorify someone who's quite diminutive in physically or intellectually or morally. Um, so um, uh, this is a uh, enormously important theme. Um, uh, the manipulation of the leader principle uh, then was so powerful and it's ongoing now. And of course, it's the same thing that in the United States, uh, Donald Trump was using uh, in, all, in all of his um, road shows, his, um, his campaign events across the country where he'd whip up the crowd into a kind of frenzy. The, the funny thing about it though is this idea of images of power is that in the current context, unlike the fascist context of the 1930s, um, while there is still now this Fuhrer principle, the leadership principle, there is the idea that every individual has as much power as the leader. Um, uh, Hitler's idea, Goebbels' idea, Mussolini's idea, Frank, Franco's idea, was that he was everything, and this is a Hobbesian idea, he was everything and the individual was nothing. And that the individual should be happy to subsume all of his particularity into the instrument of the state. But the, in the current context, it's a different kind of configuration. The idea is that the individual matters everything so that the smallest, working class guy in the town that I live in, in rural Florida now, uh, will feel himself to be a king and that his actions are as important and powerful as those uh, in the government. And he will challenge a government leader, a scientist, anybody else, that his views are just as powerful. Uh, one of the uh, remarks that's made about um, uh, COVID vaccine avoidance, if you ask someone, why aren't they doing it? They say, well, I've done my own research. I've looked into this. I've studied it. I know the answers myself. So it's a highlighting of the power, if you will, the individual, however ignorant or controlled they are by larger media. So it's a very peculiar dialectic of individual and authoritative individual, uh, the one insisting that he is the one that is the small individual insisting that he's a leader, 
And the leader oftentimes, and this does go back to the 1930s, the leader is sometimes insisting that he's no more than one of you, one of the individuals, one of the small people. That isn't actually the case with say a Franco or with a Mussolini or with Hitler, who always insisted they were far above the crowd. But they were populist demagogues in the United States and across Europe, who in the 1930s would have insisted that I'm no different than you are. We were all the same while at the same time trying to draw upon themselves great adulation and to create a, um, a leadership uh, cult around themselves. So I just think it's interesting to, to try to follow this dynamic of individual and leader and to see how images and images of power are, are deployed to marshal those, that contradiction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have talked uh, previously about Abi Barbour. And I was thinking uh, in another fundamental thinker like uh, Walter Benjamin. Uh, and I think that uh, the Abu Ghraib effect and uh, your papers uh, remind me the task of the historian that uh, Walter Benjamin uh, described, no? this idea to, to, brush, to brush history against the grain, you know? the, the, a point of view that offers the possibility to read new, new perspectives in art history or in the past and to give voice to the, to, to the oppressed. No? And, and your analysis of images of Churcher uh, in different contexts from classical Greek art, Renaissance frescoes, uh, Goya's drawings, and of course, Abu Ghraib photographs uh, fits perfectly in this idea of to brush history against uh, the grain. And this idea also, uh, outlines an ethical dimension of the art historian. No? And Ivan has uh, talked that about your, that, that you are a volunteer in this uh, coalition called the Anthropocene Alliance that focus on the effects of human activities in, in Earth. So you, you are not an academic isolated in your ivory tower, but an, acti an activist with a strong ethical commitment. So, what can we learn about this uh, way of work, or what can you tell us more about this ethical commitment and the and what we can do to change our work with this ethical uh, commitment? Right. Um, it's a very challenging thing. Um, it's a difficult thing. One of the things that you run against is um, other scholars who accuse you of um, of anachronism or presentism. That is, they'll say that well you're looking at a work of art and you are uh, projecting it into a present about which it knew nothing. And it's clear that when Goya produced his caprichos or his uh, disastrous, uh, that he knew nothing, of course, about what would happen two, two centuries later. Um, but it is possible for us uh, in the light of current events to look back and discover something new about Goya. Um, Goya, was one of the most remarkable uh, intellectual artists. I think of him and, and I always compare him to David. David was a political figure as well as an artist. Uh, Goya was an intellectual figure as well as an artist. Um, and he was someone who was able to himself brush history against the grain to reuse the traditions of Velasquez and Murillo and, and uh, the folk traditions, the popular traditions uh, within Spain and to put them to new purposes. Um, but in looking at uh, Goya or any work of the past, um, when we bring co the contemporary light of history, the political struggles or environmental struggles that we are engaged in, we discover resources of those that while the artist may not have been fully aware, they were certainly there. It isn't as if we are inventing them for them. Um, of course, it's true that there's no such thing as critical art is only critical scholars or critical interpretations. The works of art don't tell their own story. They are um, mute things, they are images, uh, but they have texts and stories that uh, surround them and that we as scholars have to draw out. But I have no doubt that interpretations that I've made of Goya or Van Gogh or Gauguin or other such figures that have been informed by recent political theory, gender theory, Marxism, et cetera, that they have revealed aspects of those works that um, the artists uh, were engaged in. There's no question about it. I mean, uh, to take Goya, his examination of ideas about torture, 
his reading or his knowledge of Cesare Beccaria or of Thomas Hobbes or of any of a number of other Enlightenment thinkers, um, that, uh, that engagement has been de-emphasized by subsequent generations of art historians precisely because they weren't thinking about contemporary issues and events. Uh, when Manet painted the model Laura as the black servant in Manet's Olympia, um, it's only because more recent gender theory and theories about racial difference and racism uh, have emerged that we've gone back and understood the degree to which a figure like Laura was important in the daily life of Paris and in the studios of artists like uh, Manet and Basile and Renoir and others who, who used her as a model. So, um, uh, uh, what else would I say about that? Just, uh, it is certainly a, a Benjaminian principle of using history in new ways. It's consulting the archive like Benjamin did. Benjamin seeking for that uh, yet sight, as he called it, this spark of recognition that occurs when you are brushing history against the grain, the combining of texts and images, unlikely ones that he finds in the library of the archive that will spark new insights and understandings. So I, I guess I, um, despite the challenges that uh, other scholars will make when we engage contemporary politics, I would say that it's only the kind of engagement that we all have that generates the enthusiasm and the questioning that will produce a good scholarship. One, one last thing, um, I have often had, and I'll miss it, uh, being retired. The reason I'm retired is because I wanna pursue the work with Anthropocene Alliance. The, the ecological challenge, the challenge of global warming is the greatest uh, that humankind has ever faced. And it may mean the end of human civilization. It's no less than that. Um, um, but uh, uh, it's always been important to me that uh, when students come to see me and ask about their, their work and about their careers, I ask them this kind of question that I derive from, from Jean-Paul Sartre, where I ask about your project. What is your, what is your engagement? What is your issue? And sometimes a student will say, well, I love art. I've always loved Impressionism, or I like the work of so-and-so, or I, I care about, you know, gender theory or about uh, post-humanism or something like that. And I say, well, that's fine, but, but really, what is it that engages you? What, what, what transformation do you want to see in your life or in your society or in your world? What really motivates you? Why should I care? Why should anybody care about the work that you're doing? And, and that will lead them, I think, to ask themselves that question. And it's from that engagement, that excitement, that enthusiasm, or even that fear that your creative work and your best scholarship will emerge. Um, and that, I think, that's certainly what motivated me. I mean, I've been motivated as much by, by hatreds as by engagement with anything else. I mean, I was, I mean, as a child, I went to museums. I loved works, works of art, all those kinds of things. But, but it was only when I really began to become a politically aware and develop my own, I guess I to put it crudely, my own hatreds, you know, whether it was of Richard Nixon or Ronald Reagan or of uh, the war against Nicaragua or um, uh, the war against nature. Uh, those are the things that have driven me and made me angry enough to want to, to find out and to challenge and to, to question. So I, again, for you all students, um, uh, I just encourage you to pursue your own individual ethical and political universes and to not make a complete separation between that and your scholarly work. The fact of this conference obviously indicates that isn't what you're doing, but there are so many temptations to pull those things completely apart. And, and my encouragement would be to find ways to creatively bring them back together while at the same time being utterly engaged uh, if you're an art historian in the in the relative autonomy works works of art, the traditional works of art, the the facture, the making of a work of art, all of its particularities. Oh, can I say one more thing about that? Sorry, just one more thing. And that is that um, it's a very hard job. It's a very hard job because, uh, particularly when you're doing the kind of art story, art history that that I do. Um, people are ready to challenge you and to cast you aside. Uh, and you have to be better prepared than everybody else. So not only do you need to know about your own particular 
field of art, but you need to know the politics and history that you're engaging to. And so, you know, you're working at various sides of your brain. You're reading this deep work of art historical, uh, sometimes arcane scholarship. On the other side, you're reading deeply in sociology or philosophy or politics or anthropology to try to bring these different parts into, into dialogue. So it's a, it's a hard thing, but um, so it's, I don't know what else to say about it. It's, it's, it's a demanding thing. So I, I encourage you, it's also exciting. So that's the, best, the good part of it. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And, and I think we have to let our sub subjective uh, thought, I mean, to not, not to be objective in the way we do things, but to let our, I mean, to, to express our desires, our thoughts, and our the way we see the world must be the way we do our uh, research. And it will be also a, a very, uh, I think, uh, every one of us uh, do uh, the research that we do has to do with something that is only that we only know ourselves. I mean, I, I do research to to understand myself. I mean, and maybe it's a very selfish way to to do research, but it's true. I, I I do research of the topics that that make me that that, that explain myself in the world. What is my position in the world? My doubts in the right. world, and how I understand the world. Um, and I think that if every student uh, listens uh, his voice or her voice, uh, right. it would be a great research. Can I ask uh, some of you um, uh, about the things that you're studying? Um, would a few of you be willing to? I just see various faces, and I could, I can, if you don't mind, I, I could be the professor uh, uh, or the old professor, to those who are professors, uh, and ask. Particularly, so I, I see uh, Anna. Uh, Aitana Fernandez, um, and then I see Daniel Perez uh, Pimes uh, there. I wonder if you both would just say very briefly what kinds of studies or inquiries you're engaged in at the moment. Anna, would you like to No, no, start? come on. Go, go. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I, I thank Stephen for being so nice and kind, and it's been wonderful. Uh, I'm actually a PhD candidate and at the art history department in the Universidad de Girona. And I'm working on the relationships uh, between um, the cinema of the early cinema and contemporary digital aesthetics. So it's kind of a comparative analysis uh, between uh, the work of David Lynch and the films uh -huh. of the early cinema. David Lynch and early cinema. And well, why, why is there a connection at all? I, I think about, um, I certainly see the, a surrealist element and certain motifs. You think about Méliès and, and images of the eyes and uh, bodily distortion and um, uh, leaps of logic. Is Lynch consciously reaching back to that early history or is it something uh, else entirely? Well, I, I cannot tell. I mean, there are like some of his short films which were explicitly made following the uh, Lumiere's technique. In fact, there is this collective film, uh, which probably you all have seen, which uh, was made for the centenary of the, of the beginning of cinema when where Lynch was given a camera like this box, this wooden box, and he had to shoot a film following all these aspects, but further than this, which is more like uh, trivia, I think that uh, in everything he's working at, there's like a certain uh, will for uh, res like seeing, uh, coming back to a, a beginning or starting something. So we could talk about a Grade zero of representation or something like that, which he comes right. when when he works with the digital and um, well. well. One of the I'll give one 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 suggestion um, in terms of the degree zero of cinema of David Lynch. You know about his cartooning when he was first starting out. He was responsible yes. for this extraordinary cartoon, you know, called "The World's Angriest Dog," and it was just a single cartoon frame of this dog straining at the leash. And then it would have, he would run it every week in the Village Voice in New York and it would have a different caption 
uh, oftentimes. But it was, in a way, the, the cinema still, the single shot of cinema, uh, repeated constantly. So in some ways, there is a rudimentary character about his, his imagination. They, as you call it, a degree zero, barking degree zero that uh, yes, is manifested there. So, in fact, I mean, it's, it's fantastic because all the elements of his filmography and his hard work are indeed present in that uh, drawing. You have the industrial landscape, uh, <laughs> like this uh, eerie image, and also the house, the familiar home. And well, yeah, it's... Right. it's good, good, good. Good, good. Uh, so, so Anna then, so tell me, if, do you mind my doing this, uh, Louise? Is this messing up your... Uh, no, 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 perfect. Uh, Anna, uh, Yes, hi. Um, well, I'm part of this research project, and we are now with uh, Alan Salvador and Brunella Tedesco, that is, she's not here right now. We are uh, researching about uh, media trials and the images that come from this, uh, from cinema and from all the photographs that are published in media. Sorry, media trials, did you say? Yeah, media trials and um, the images of the defendants uh, ah. during these uh, judicial processes. Uh, and and what, what, so what group of trials, what period of trials you mean? Well, it's, it's trials in Spain because most of the photographs that we are, we, um, we analyze the covers, the, the pictures that are in the covers of the of three Spanish uh, uh, journals. So right. uh, during 2011 and 2017. And all these uh, photographs that are related to, to trials and judicial uh, sphere uh, right. We analyze this kind of, of pictures and we uh, try to understand which are the visual motives that we can see and how is the, um, uh. how judicial power uh, can some, somehow control or uh, censor media. I see. And uh, just one last question. Is there some archetypal set of images that um, recur uh, throughout different stages of the trial. Uh, one thinks about in the United States, there's a famous set of images either before the trial, it's called a perp walk, where the perpetrator, the, the accused, this, who might be the criminal, is, is walked uh, from the jail cell uh, or from home to jail or from the jail cell to the courthouse. And the person always walks through a phalanx of photographers, uh, all with the cameras all sh shooting, et cetera. And they're always ducking and they may be covering their face so as not to be seen. That'd be one. And then you, of course, you have the image of the, of the defendant sitting at the table, or in the, in the case of Spain or in England, in the dock, uh, isolated, alone, uh, vulnerable, so I, I imagine there must be a set of types, uh, typologies that occur. And I guess, is that the kinds of images that you're talking about that you're trying to under, understand uh, how these are framed, how these um, impact the guilt or innocence of a, of a defendant? Yeah, how um, the audience or the people who read these newspapers uh, receive or, or perceive right. these, these uh, right these images. Right, so yes, no, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of typologies uh, of the, the images of the defendants and the accused. Right. And right. we have uh, the cage during the trial and everything like that. Right. I would encourage you to look at um, Domier's images of trials and of the law. Honoré Domier, the great French caricaturist. Okay, the 18, perfect. 1830s, particularly those are the 1830s because they're Many of them that show the defendants resisting, uh, and there'll be there's a most remarkable one where where uh, a defendant is uh, a journalist I think is being restrained and gagged, and uh, the the judge reaches over and says, "Go ahead, you have the floor. Uh, explain yourself." 
the meanwhile, he's gagged, so he can't speak. So uh, he was himself looking at the typologies uh, that existed uh, in other in other images and that occurred in the courtrooms and trying to find ways to counter those. So that might be that might be something interesting there for you. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, anyway, so I'm sorry, at least I don't know, I have no, Luis, I have no idea how we're doing with time or what you how you how you want to proceed. Uh, I, I find this part to me the most interesting thing of all, but but because uh, I hear myself talk all the time, it's nice to hear you guys. But um, Luis, we we can do whatever you. I can. I'd be happy to uh, ask more students about what their work. But, but uh, I don't want to interrupt you if you. No, don't worry. I mean, I have prepared uh, at the end of the conversation. I would like to show a couple of images uh, that has to do with uh, the Afghanistan war, just to oh. to start a debate. Maybe it can be, and then uh, we can open the microphones and, and everybody sure. and everyone can can uh, can talk. But okay, uh, th th that project has to do with power and images, you know, I mean, a very specific power, you know, the justice sure. uh, and how we perceive as spectators, you know, the, 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 the power of, I mean, the, the idea of trials and trials. this kind of, of, of things, you no? Know? Uh, mm -hmm. But if you want, I can, I, can, well, maybe, I would like maybe to- just one, 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 Maybe just one more and then we'll turn it back to you, Luis, if that's okay. okay. Is there one, one, one among you um, who would particularly like to to say something about what they're doing uh, without my uh, picking on you. Is anybody who'd like to to help? Um, how about um, let's see. I, I'll just randomly. I'll. I'll just go like, um, how about Edurne? Edurne? Okay? Yeah, Edurne. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I'm also a PhD student. I'm actually beginning my PhD um, this year, uh -huh. so it's very, very like starting. Early, yeah. But um, it's about a uh, female archetypes and its relationship with the abject, and like working with different kind of. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm thinking of uh, starting with. Um, art and its relationship also with contemporary cinema and iconographic uh, perspective. So it's a, it's a feminist a feminist project, uh, yeah. uh, but not just that, but also dealing with images of women? Yeah. I see, I see. Um, well, I, uh, I'll, I'll only say that uh, because it's so preliminary, I won't. I can't say very much about yeah, it's, about what you're doing. I'm starting I, this I year, say, so I'm sorry. I would just say that the the bibliography, the art historical bibliography, is vast. Um, uh, I'm sure you know the the feminist scholarship in art history, uh, including uh, people like Linda Nochlin, uh, Abigail Solomon Godot, uh, uh, many, 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 many others. Tamar Garb. Um, so I just uh, just encourage you to to be sure you get a handle on that because there are some just brilliant scholars who have been uh, asking about um, these subjects since the late 70s and there's much much more to do um, particularly with contemporary images but I just uh, again hope that you will engage that that art historical tradition. Thank you. Okay. Um, Luis, I'll hand it back to you. You wanted to show some images, you said? Uh, yes, but before, yes, uh, sure. I would like to, to come back to an argument that I would like to, to introduce in the conversation because I think that you are specialized in, in depictions or images of uh, the worst side of humanity. Torture, right, violations, murders, the effects of war, animal torture, climate crisis, no, I mean, it's not a very happy topic, but uh, all these ideas or these topics can be summarized in one topic that I read in one of your papers, no, the idea that power focuses on the extermination of heterogeneity. So I found this idea very interesting, no, because uh, differences of religion, differences of culture, even differences of a species between man and animal i think it's one of the ideas that you are that you work in your in, in your paper so this i mean can, can you explain a little bit more about how we can be more inclusive and democratic in our in our job no how can 
we be more inclusive with this idea of heterogeneity? Because it's right. also a, a probably a, a critic, I mean, a, a polemic topic. I mean, I don't know how this idea of animal rights or even the anachronic point of view, you know, that you have told previously that some scholars are, uh, don't, don't agree right. with you with that point of view, but this, right. this idea that we have to talk about the, the heterogeneity of our world to respect the differences. So it's, right. well, this is the idea that right. I would like to, I mean, right. to well, ask. Um, uh, of course, the quotation, the extermination of heterogeneity uh, is in mind, it comes from um, the Nazi legal theorist, Carl Schmitt. Um, and for him, as for uh, others uh, in his circle, uh, it was the essential job of the state to eliminate heterogeneity. Uh, uh, the uh, Nazis spoke about uh, bringing into conformity, bringing all the organs of the state, uh, bringing um, civil society into conformity with the needs of the Führer, of the, who himself embodies um, uh, the Nazi organization. So um, uh, the counter side of that, the uh, counter hegemonic, uh, means to liberate, emancipate all those heterogeneous forces. Um, that means uh, dissidents of all kinds. And there's a great tradition of that as well. And that goes back certainly to the Enlightenment, but back, back to antiquity, uh, to writings of Aristotle and to many other cultural and philosophical traditions. But certainly in the period of the Enlightenment, uh, one thinks about uh, the art and writings of William Blake. Uh, one thinks about um, uh, the writers who spoke about animal liberation, uh, that I've discussed in The Cry of Nature, Art of the Making of Animal Rights. One thinks about Shelley, of Keats, the Romantics, Byron. These are some of the most radical figures of the time. And they were uh, aberrant, that is they were outside the norms in respect to gender identities, um, um, uh, sexual expression, um, in the notion that humans uh, should not have no right to exercise domain over animals, uh, that all are uh, equally valid forms of life. Um, and so that, that, that counter hegemonic or counter institutional uh, constitutes a long and valuable and powerful tradition. And so I, while um, I felt, uh, Luis, um, a bit embarrassed and sad when you described all the nasty subjects that I write about in my art, um, I, I know that in my, in my soul anyway, and sometimes in my writing, I hope, I'm also able to represent the alternative voices, certainly in the yeah. in the cry of nature. And uh, there is always in hope the, in that paper. Well, there, there is always yes, hope. I mean, yes, it's uh, when you say it that way, it sounds really desperate. When somebody anybody says there's always hope, you mean it means there's no hope. Um, so uh, so I'm a little worried about that. But but I but but you, one can identify alternative critical structures that do exist counter hegemonic forces that exist. And there's certainly many of them, you know, right now, um, uh, in terms of uh, in the United States and globally, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter movements and, um, and the uh, liberation struggles of uh, uh, queer and transgender uh, peoples. Um, you know, there's, there's clearly major setbacks and then there's steps forward. And so, you know, uh, uh, William Morris, um, the great English designer and socialist, um, quoting from, um, uh, I forget the Hegelian theorist, but anyway, he was, he spoke about history working not in a straight line, but in a spiral. And that is that um, you move up to a certain level and um, at that level, there will be setbacks and you'll be pushed to the side. Uh, but then the spiral will continue and uh, at each level there will be uh, the achievements of the previous histories and generations will be recognized and brought back to the to the front and so i i, I certainly don't uh, want to to speak like obama does quoting martin luther king about the uh, arc of history moves toward progress etc 
because right now we're in a moment when because of a climate crisis particularly and and threats of pandemic and even nuclear war you know it's not looking too hopeful but there are certainly counter hegemonic forces that can be identified and embraced and, and written about so you know those of you who are writing about the challenges of power and authority um, certainly have it have an opportunity and responsibility to highlight um, alternatives out there I mean and there are there are victories I mean and it's, and it's very inspiring when you when you achieve a victory it's uh, it makes another one possible you know you that's one of the things that we're trying to do with Anthropocene Alliance that is you achieve maybe small victories in one place and that emboldens a community to try to do more and then another community outside to do the same thing um, we did the same thing when working with the uh, prisons uh, I, Luis, I think I sent you an article about our work to try to close a supermax prison in Illinois. That was a, an all solitary confinement prison. And it was a five year effort to close it down and we succeeded. And it, it succeeded because of small victories along the way that, that opened up possibilities again and again. So we, we reached one or two legislators in Illinois who in turn helped put pressure on one or two officials in the prison system who in turn, uh, which in turn allowed us to think about what the budgets were for the prisons and how much was spent, which allowed us to have entree into the governor's office, which allowed us to reach the governor and to talk to the governor, which allowed us to speak to US senators, each one building a little bit onto the other until the pressure is, is brought to bear. So there can be victories out there and the cultural component, the artistic component, which was very important for the TAMG attend project and is important for the Anthropocene Alliance one, uh, that plays a crucial role. So I, I don't think that any of you doing art historical work uh, need ever to fear uh, that your work is on the margins of the major issues and crises and opportunities of this moment. You're right in the heart of it. Okay, great. Um, uh, I think it's time to, to open the, the conversation, but I would like to show a couple of images, I mean, to to, to provoke the, the, the discussion or because uh, I would like to finish returning to, to Abu Ghraib photographs because in August, uh, President Joe Biden decided to leave Afghanistan after 20 years of war. No? Then I, I thought on, about on these images again. This war has been the longest war in American history. And in my opinion, those photographs are the images of that war. I mean, it's like the Guernica no? in the Spanish Civil War or the wars in the night of the 20th century, the Abu Ghraib photographs are the, um, the images of the war. I mean, they, it can summarize all the tragedy of, of the war. But besides those photographs, in my opinion, there is another image that can uh, not summarize or uh, speaks uh, from himself of, of the war, that those images are the shocking footage of people falling from the planes that are taking off from Kabul airport. No? And when I saw these images, I immediately thought in the in one photograph of 9-11 uh, attacks, the photograph of the falling men. So right. I thought that there was a, a coincidence, no? an uncanny coincidence between those images. The yeah. One is the beginning of the war, and the yes. other one is the end of the war. No? People falling from terror. And what kind of fall yeah. means that uh, what well, that images? And I have uh, the images, and I would like to share just to I mean to open discussion or uh, I think it's uh, is sharing you no know, the the PowerPoint or not? Mm -hmm. yeah, it is. Yes, we can see. Okay. I, I think this, those photographs uh, embraces the war. No, it's the the, the beginning, uh, falling from yes. terror, and the other, and, and the end. No, people falling also. No, what what? Uh, I mean, it was a kind of open conversation just to think in in the images of the war. Not only the Abu Ghraib uh, photographs, but why people are falling in in this war. I mean, is the is a moral fall of uh, Mankin what these people falling uh, means? It's a kind of I mean, uh, just to 
to provoke, I mean, uh, inter, uh, some discussions and, and even uh, to, to, uh, to introduce another image, the last photograph, no? again, this is the, the, the last American in Afghanistan, no? the, the Major General Chris Donahue and how this right. image talks also about the war, uh, the night vision, the, the technology, no, the, the last photograph of, of the world and the last uh, uh, American. Well, my, my idea was to, to show these images, to open the discussion. And I mean, I think Ivan that we can open microphones if someone wants to talk or even Stephen wants uh, to say something about this, uh, this photograph. You are the, the expert on the, on these images of, uh, of war. Well, it's very, it's very profound what you've uh, presented here. Um, the only thing I would, I would offer, I would offer a caution though, and that is a couple. One is that these images, uh, particularly the one at the left, less so the one at the right, uh, but also the one with the general leaving with the night vision goggles one are already so mediated. They've already been so often reproduced that they, they've achieved a certain kind of icon status. And whether it's possible for us to see those in a clear and critical way um, uh, is, I wonder how possible that is. And you wonder whether we may not be falling victim to a, a set of manipulations that are that are pre-existing our our opportunity pre-existing us. That is, when we see this, we're already in the thrall of a certain mediated experience. We're already being controlled. The narrative is already being told for us. Uh, mm -hmm. the case in this case, particularly so because the tragedies are made to seem in some way similar or equivalent or logical. This leads to that. And in fact, of course, the uh, attack in the World Trade Center had nothing to do with Afghanistan. I mean, uh, Obama's, uh, uh, bin Laden took refuge there, but it didn't require a war invasion and toppling of the Taliban to get bin Laden. And, and of course, the, all the attackers in 9-11 were Saudis. There were none of them uh, Afghanis. So it makes a, an argument that there's a relationship between the two when there is none. Moreover, it makes the image of Kabul seem as if it was an image of American, uh, uh, what would you say, irresponsibility in pulling out when uh, I would argue that it was absolutely essential to pull out and we should have done so, you know, 20 years ago, we never should have gone in. So I, uh, with all those provisos and all that caution, it's fascinating, but there is a real risk that we will fall into the traps that images like these uh, open up. Okay, so I think we can, Ivan, if you would like, I think we can. Yeah, I, I would like to open the possibility to talk to everybody. I was just thinking about this this mediation of the first image. In fact, it's, it's almost impossible not to think of the of the opening of the TV series Mad Men when we yes, see yes. this image. You know? yeah. and, and obviously, this is something that doesn't allow us to to think directly on 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 the real problem uh, behind uh, the, the, the attack uh, that obviously was a, a, a very complex geopolitical uh, question. But now I think that there's something fascinating when you, when you put together the, these two images that uh, leads me, for example, to, to something that uh, Ariela Sulay told us um, first or, or some things that, for example, uh, Jean-Luc Godard sometimes uh, says that it's it's very difficult and it's ethically very always very um, 
delicate the, the idea of juxtaposing two images, no? Because there's something this interval in the in the middle in in a Barbourgian uh, uh, sense that uh, makes very very difficult uh, for me uh, also to approach the, the second image because it's something for which we have no reference, no? This is it's such a clean image. Uh, and on the other hand, there's there's another question: is the reference on the left is is something very close to our way of living here in in Europe or in the States? And it's always this: there's always this decolonizing uh, gaze, uh, where. I don't know, the, something that for me is important after reading uh, the Bugari Effect or, or your papers, Stephanie, is uh, something that we have been discussing before, that is, where is the place in which uh, every one of us as researchers put ourselves in front of the images? Uh, mm -hmm. This is very difficult some, sometimes. I don't know, Luis, what, what do you think also about, about that, but um, for example, the second image could be the, the, the next image, the, the last man in Afghanistan could be from uh, a lot of uh, action movies, but uh, obviously is is creating a dialogue with the last uh, Russian soldier in Afghanistan in uh, 1989 for me, uh, it's like uh, the shot counter shot, uh, but, but it's, the, the, the question is always the, the context. Uh, I don't know what what do you think uh, because everybody of us we are uh, working with with images these days. We are trying to recreate contexts, and it's very difficult in 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 these cases. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if and I will transform this. In a in a question for you, Stephen, because right. this right. we want to listen. But uh, at right. the end, there's a problem of overrepresentation and underrepresentation always. And right. what what could we think that is underrepresented right now in the situation in Afghanistan, for example? What do you think? Uh, right. Well, um, about this image, uh, I would just say that it's. An iconic image. Um, it's a last man image. There's a tremendous amount of literature of the last man, the last man after nuclear holocaust, the last man after an ecological catastrophe, uh, the last man after an epidemic. All, all these things are, are last man imagery. And it goes back to the romantic period, even uh, the Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is about a last man as he's, uh, the monster is trooping across the Arctic and the, the end of his life is kind of a last man. And I think there was a novel, I think by Mary Shelley wrote another novel called something like The Last Man. So there's a lot of imagery of The Last Man. And this image also has a, um, a slightly scary uh, patriotic uh, or jingoistic element. That is the beleaguered American, uh, proud, forced to surrender, just like in Vietnam, we weren't allowed to win is the story that's always told the Vietnam War by forces on the right. We could have won, but those liberals, uh, those those communists uh, outside, those hippie protesters uh, prevented us from winning. And that's kind of imagery that you have here too. The proud American soldier uh, wants to complete the mission, but is prevented from doing so by the cowards uh, who control the government or the media. So um, th I suppose all that is what's left out of this image. That is all those counter narratives and stories. So I guess when you see this image, you want to, just as you suggested, you want to see what are all the other strings of images that aren't seen. Among the things, for example, that weren't seen uh, were images of dead American soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and, when the, and also the piling up of coffins when uh, during the Iraq war, uh, George Bush uh, famously, I think it was he personally or his staff, prevented the release of photographs of coffins that are being loaded up 
uh, and taken on American planes back to the United States um, because uh, it would have uh, undermined uh, American support to the degree it existed for the wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan. So those images perhaps needed to be juxtaposed to this image. Uh, images of the uh, uh, dead Afghanis who were killed in drone strikes. Uh, we don't see those images. You know that the Pentagon has a huge archive of photographs like that. And it also has archives of photographs of tortured uh, Afghan and Iraqi uh, supposed terrorists. Uh, we don't see those uh, photographs or images. So those are the intertexts, those are the string of images, the lineage of images that need to be brought in to make sense of a photograph like this, I'd say. But I'd like to hear other, other of you uh, reaction to these photographs. And, uh... I think Laya. Hi, um, maybe it's a bit out of, out of the subject, but these photos made me think about um, how some Afghan women are trying to um, project a more nuanced image of, of what is uh, the multiplicity of Afghan women through photography. And I'm thinking of Fatima Hosseini, who, uh, uh, who fled to Paris and is now giving exhibitions there with her photographs um, that are both uh, are principally stage photographs um, of women wearing like traditional clothes that are very, very uh, colorful and how she wants to give like, you know, we're so, we, so used to seeing women in burqa and wearing very dark clothes. And she was like, there's another, there's another perspective of, of a rich culture behind it that it's important that the world knows it. And I'm not seeing these photos um, that are, you know, are, are, they are taken by um, Afghan photographers. So in first person, I'm not seeing them on the news or uh, they're talking a lot about women, but maybe they are not showing um, the creative work that they are doing or that they have done through these years. So it makes me think that, um, you know, uh, we've seen these images that um, uh, we're seeing now here a lot, but it's important to remember, I think that um, um, they, are, they can make their own pictures too. Um, they sh it should be valued instead of maybe just watching photos taken by uh, Americans or Europeans that have been there. So uh, yeah. I think it's, that's, that's brilliant. Uh, it could be that we've been coerced. There, there's an oppression uh, exercised by photographs like these uh, when there's a whole other world of, of photography <clears throat> and of images that we are denied. I think that's that's great, Laya. I think that's 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 brilliant. Yeah, I, I agree completely. No, we we have we must write a new book about images of Abu Ghraib or, or Afghanistan with those old, with another right. uh, with different photographs. No, and, and to right. criticize right. this Western narrative that focus in this kind of uh, photographs like that are very also very close to cinema. I was thinking in Zero Dark Thirty, you know, the movie about uh, Bin Laden, you know, the, the end of the movie is uh, Bin Laden's death is film, I remember, using this night vision. And I think those images are, as you, as Stephen or Ariban, I don't remember who said this, and it's part of our narrative, you know, from the Western world, maybe what right. we want to see in that world, not what is the reality of that world, not that Laya has explained uh, very well, other possibilities, other voices, you know, this idea that we were talking previously, you know, the, 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 to brush history against the grain, also here to brush history, or to brush the images against the grain is to, to show another, to see and to show another different images that uh, explain better is what, what is happening in Afghanistan. All right. All right. Thank you. Manuel? I think. Thank you, Luis. Uh, I, I'm, I was going to go back to perhaps to the, the previous comparison because I'm still, as okay. Ivan said, thinking about it. And actually, I should shut up after Laya said that, not because I'm going to get into a Western interpretation, blah, blah, blah. But uh, for me, this image like immediately makes me think about an economical signifier 
the economy because of the crack of the 29, uh, the Wall Street crack and the images of falling, falling bankers or the suicides tied to that. Uh, there are, of course, artists who have used that, like Yves Klein, you know, with the, with the jumping sure. series sure. and other people. But in terms of the film and media archaeology, the first image of a falling person uh, that's been recorded, at least that I know of, it's a 1912 newsreel shot in France, in Paris, where an inventor, Franz Reichelt, uh, called all the media from the time to show off his new invention, which was a disguise to be able to fly. And he went up the field over, and this is recorded. If you Google it right now, Luis, you will find it. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he basically jumped to prove the efficiency, the economical efficiency, the promise of the technology, the promise of these uh, this guys to fly and, and the economy killed him because the journalists were there and, and he actually had to jump to prove the efficiency uh, of his invention. So this is better explained by, by Angel Quintana, who is the professor with whom Daniel Perez is doing his PhD project, Stephen, in Girona, the one that he explained about Lynch and early cinema. But my point is that for me, the economical signifiers are there all the time. And this is not only because we've been working with that, but the World Trade Center, the building is there. Right. There is a, a, a weight that is pulling the bodies. And this weight for me is the weight of the economy. Uh, and I don't know, I, I, can, I can stop there. I think there is a film by Roy Anderson called Songs from the Second Floor where this is put in, in a very efficient way. This is translated into a moment of sacrifice of a little girl who is made to jump. They made her suicide for the sake of the economy. And there is this incredible image of how the, the gurus of the economy, the authorities, all the official Swedish apparatus, they ask this girl to jump and this, this jump to the void is supposed to save the country from the apocalypse and the apocalypse is economic. And I, I leave it there, sorry, but it's just what you made me. Thank you, Luis, for, for bringing this, this comparison, which, which is very provocative. And Laia, thank you for saying that we should all shut up, which maybe we, we should probably do. I think that was brilliant, Manuel. That was a brilliant analysis of the, and you know, the, what, it's funny, the, the falling man image of the left also reminds me of, uh, New York, but also French art of the 1960s. Uh, Daniel Burin um, or Frank Stella with the striped stripes behind him, which of course is part of the same language of the building itself, the Yamasaki building. And uh, that too, that, that, that art was a, uh, a kind of, what would you call it? Uh, an efficient uh, aesthetic machine. Uh, very much in conformity with the uh, business practices, the rationalized business practices of the late 1950s, 1960s. Um, the restraint as well of the corporate personality uh, with the regularity of the lines of that. So I, I think it, it, you're right to highlight that. And it's also why that image at the right is so very different and um, tragic in a different very different way and so but i think you've drawn out some important elements of that so thank you uh, Laya? yeah i just wanted to clarify that i didn't mean to to say that we have to shut up just that <laughs> because I, i've seen these images so so met so so many times and now i've thought oh i haven't seen those others the same amount of time, so it, yeah. it, I didn't mean we couldn't talk about this. It was a joke. It was a joke, <laughs> I, but 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 you you were right. I think. Well, okay. I, uh, I think I can stop uh, sharing the presentation, and I don't know, Ivan, if we can. Maybe I think that that, that this uh, these last reflections are are quite good. Maybe to 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 close uh, the the session because it's been two wonderful days of 
reflecting on images or, or of trying to to define maybe one one of the main things and the main conclusions of the project and something that is very present in in all that uh, Stephen you have been writing in last years that it's that uh, political philosophy today is something that we have to do from the images uh, they are necessary because uh, we we have this sensation that when we are trying to to do research on, on images we are not just um, thinking about uh, motives but uh, about questions of engagement and commitment with the definition of the state uh, in the sense that you have demonstrated to 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 us and that's a, a very important lesson for for us even this question that manuel uh, told us that the the, the the presence of economy uh, everywhere no all, all the images um, are related with with economy so uh, we want to thank you very much for having been with us during all this time without not knowing that you were uh, in being a reference for us and also for your kindness and generosity with us today uh, because uh, it's it's been a, a very great pleasure to to know you and and to receive your 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 um, talk and, and your impressions about this these images so thank you very much um, thank you for being so generous thank you to everybody uh, I won't try to uh, I will not try to to close all the all the conference it would be too much because there are many many uh, questions in 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 these two days but uh, maybe uh, just to remember one one thing that is the the, the importance of the work of, of images of, of uh, what what people doing images do to 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 make these images and to connect with uh, motives and and with a commitment with the state this idea that you uh, have explained it to us uh, when talking about Goya uh, Stephen so this is uh, maybe the most important thing and uh, yeah only to to close I share with you with maybe some of you don't know the page of the project in which which has been developed by Carolina uh, and, and, and in which we have put some different lessons and video essays uh, developed by Edurne that was here and some other uh, uh, researchers uh, linked to the group. So thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you to, to everybody. Yeah. And well, I, I only hope I, I only hope that the next time could be not virtual and, and can be in presence with with uh, direct contact. So thank you, thank you to everybody. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you so much. So long. Thank you, Luis, for developing this uh, conversation. Bye. Bye. Thank you thank to you. everybody. Gracias a todos por estar ahí. Y bueno, como has dicho Iván, espero que la próxima vez sea presencial y aunque la imagen es lo que nos mueve, ¿no? pues que sea algo más antropológico de tocarnos como cuerpos ¿no? y no quedarnos como pantalla, como, como imagen, ¿no? que, que estas iconografías de la pandemia ¿no? que, que tenemos pues han estado bien, pero ya eh, toca volver a lo, a lo presencial. Ya ni a Prau. Eso.